Thank you all for coming today. Um, thank you. <laughs> As some of you may know, I've, I've been filling in for Chris Kobach on his Sunday evening show. So if you have a chance to listen tomorrow night from 6 to 8, do that. We've been concentrating on stopping voter fraud, which is the theme of uh, Chris's campaign. And it's, as we've been learning in Northeast Kansas City, it's not just a, a imagination, it's not just an imaginative, you know, riff on Chris's part, it's a very real problem. I've also been filling in for uh, Chris Tagal in the morning occasionally, from 5 to 9 a.m., 7 to 10 a.m., KCMO. Chris Kobach, as you know, is running for Secretary of State. Most of you know enough about him that I don't have to tell you too much. But um, we are extraordinarily blessed here to have in our midst probably the leading national authority on the whole question of uh, the law revolving around illegal immigration. He's also a professor at UMKC, the law school, the showing up there of which takes more courage than most people have to face in their lifetimes. It's not a friendly environment for people of, of your and mine and Chris's persuasion, but nonetheless, he's uh, done a very good job doing that. And uh, without further ado, Chris Kobach. Thanks, Jack. Thank you all for being here. Is this great weather or what? It's awesome. Well, hey, we're uh, as you know, this this rally has a lot of parts to it. We're going to talk. We're, we've been talking about Obamacare. Actually, I went to a uh, a, a little ca chamber of commerce event yesterday, and uh, one of Kathleen Sebelius's representatives was there, and she insisted on calling it the Affordable Care Act. They don't call it Obamacare over in some circles, but we call it Obamacare because that's what it is, and it's uh, soon going to be a relic of a program that has been defunded and ultimately repealed. But I thought I'd just say a few words about Obamacare, and uh, we're going to have some country music starting uh, after I'm done. And then uh, later in the, in, the, in the program, I'll say a few words about illegal immigration and where we are on that. But uh, just a few things you might not have known about Obamacare. Well, let's, let's start way back in the 19th century. Of course, Abraham Lincoln said, this is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, right? And in the government of and by and for the people, you would expect that a, uh, a program as massive as Obamacare would have broad popular support, right? But of course that didn't happen, did it? We, um, if you go back in history and you look at all of the major acts that Congress has passed, acts that really transform our economy, every single one of them had bipartisan support. Go back over 100 years, the Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890, that's the first time Congress really tried to regulate the American economy. Before that, they did it the way the Founding Fathers wanted. The states regulated economic affairs, and that's the way it should be. But in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, and Congress said, we're going to have to do something here to, to uh, bust these trusts. And it was passed unanimously, unanimously in the United States House. Skip forward, the next major act that Congress passed to alter the economy in some way was, of course, the Social Security Act of 1935. Again, Social Security Act passed with broad Republican support. Uh, only 33 representatives and seven senators voted no. Skip forward, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Also, both parties, all Americans coming together. Did you know that despite the fact that the Democrats claim the Civil Rights Act was their act, uh, the statistics tell a different story, uh, it had the support of 80% of the Republicans in the United States House, and it had the support of 63% of the Democrats in the United States House. Again, broad bipartisan support. And so we come to the year 2010 and Obamacare. How many Republicans voted for Obamacare? Zero. Why? Because the American people wouldn't have voted for Obamacare. The polls on the eve of its passing showed that between 52 and 57 percent of Americans were opposed to it. And there was only one party that stood for the will of the American people and said, no. Heck no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to bankrupt our economy. We're not going to force future generations, not just our kids, but our grandchildren, to pay for this. And one party stood its ground on behalf of the American people. But nevertheless, Obamacare passed. Now, um, how many votes did Obamacare have in the United States Senate? 
50? No, it had 60. Exactly the number it needed to pass a filibuster. Now, could it be that one of those 60 votes might have been cast by someone who didn't actually win his seat? Al Franken, exactly. We now know, since a report has been done this past summer, you heard about it on Fox News, not on the Communist News Network or any of the other channels, but on Fox News you heard that an independent group confirmed that 341 felons voted illegally in that election, almost all of them in the liberal precincts of Minneapolis-St. Paul. How many votes did uh, Al Franken have at the end of the day? 312. So it's almost certain now, we'll never know for sure, that that election was stolen and Obamacare was passed without the requisite votes to pass a Senate filibuster. So we have an unconstitutional act passed by a Senate where the deciding vote was not an actual fairly elected senator. Now one more thing about Obamacare. Obamacare is a huge step on the way to socialism, isn't it? Indeed, uh, if you look at the people who talked about socialism in America back in the 1950s, they said we have to get nationalized health care. If you get the people addicted to nationalized health care, then they will be addicted to government handouts, and then everything else follows after that. And so they get Obama, they, they get the, so, the yoke of socialism fitted around the American neck and get Americans uh, pulling in the service of the government. But in order to keep it going, they've got to have more Americans dependent upon Obamacare than there are Americans paying in to the system. Well, how do you do that? Well, one way to do it would be to get an extra 12 million people instantly eligible for Obamacare. And that brings us back to immigration. It all fits together so nicely. In Obamacare, there's an interesting provision. It says that if you are an alien in the United States and you become legal, or you happen to enter legally, you instantly become eligible for Obamacare. Now that's not the way it's used to be in American law. Other government benefits, you have to wait five years and be here legally five years. Because in America, if you're an immigrant, we welcome you if you come legally, but don't come here expecting American taxpayers to hand you, to hand you goodies when you walk across the border. Well, Obamacare changes that. The moment a person enters or becomes legal, they're eligible instantly. What does that do? That gets another 11 to 12 million people feeding at the trough, dependent upon government benefits, willing to vote for those politicians who will sell out their country and sell out the Constitution in order to give those benefits and in order to claim power for themselves. There are so many things buried in this Obamacare bill that are truly pernicious, truly uh, eros corrosive in our, in our uh, country, in our Constitution, our economy. And I finally want to end with our U.S. Constitution. Many of you have already heard about this. You know that the individual mandate in Obamacare is unconstitutional. Never before has the American Congress attempted to force American people to buy anything. Never before has that been attempted. But now our Congress tells you, you have to purchase health insurance. You have to play in this government-controlled sector now. We're not going to let you have the freedom to choose or not to choose to buy. Article 1 of the Constitution says what Congress can do, and you'll find nothing in Article 1 that comes even close to authorizing Congress to do that. And so they've tried to squeeze it through the door of the interstate commerce power, which is found in Article 1, Section 8. But the interstate commerce power has never been used to force people who are not even engaged in commerce to start engaging in commerce and buying health insurance or buying anything, for that matter. And that's what the big issue is in the courts today. You've probably heard there have been a number of decisions already. There's a court in Florida looking at the issue. There's a court in Michigan looking at the issue. And it's going to go to the United States Supreme Court. And I just hope and pray that we have at least five justices sitting on the court who will rule in favor of the U.S. Constitution and not in favor of the politically driven agenda of the Obama administration. We have the world's first constitutional republic. The first republic where we can actually confine the powers of government. And for the better part of 200 years, we've actually had a functioning constitutional republic where government more or less stays within its boundaries. But now is perhaps the greatest test of the American Constitution, and I'm not exaggerating. This is the test. Will this government, 
aided by the political force of people who want government handouts of a very generous sort in the form of Obamacare, will they succeed in breaching the constitutional boundaries? Or will the Supreme Court do its job and enforce those constitutional boundaries? That's the question. And this case is headed to the Supreme Court. And the ultimate answer will depend, will not only decide Obamacare, it'll decide everything. Because if the Supreme Court says that Obamacare is a regulation of interstate commerce, then anything could be an interstate a regu a regulation of interstate commerce. And ultimately, our Constitution will become meaningless because government can just do whatever it wants. It will no longer be confined in a meaningful way by the words of our Constitution. And so, I'm going to close with the words of Benjamin Franklin. You know, at the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia, they were drafting a Constitution behind closed doors. They wanted the deliberations to be full and frank and open and so that they could produce the best product possible and then show it to the American people. Well, a lady asked Benjamin Frank Franklin, she said, uh, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you drafted in this convention? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, Mr. Obama, we want our republic back. Thank you very much. joining us shortly, but before that, uh, one more time, the inimitable Chris Kobach. When he's uh, presented with uh, unemployment nearing 10%, I'd like to see a president who doesn't say he's going to find some shovel-ready job and address the problem that way with a job that doesn't exist. I'd like to see a president who recognizes that if you have 10% unemployment, the way to create a job for an American tomorrow is to deport an illegal alien today. I'd like to see a president who recognizes that one of the things that draws people to America from all over the world is the rule of law. I'd like to see a president who recognizes that that's what we have to preserve, the rule of law and the rule of the United States Constitution, because if we lose that, then we lose what makes America such an attractive place in the first place. I'd like to see a president who recognizes that uh, a country without secure borders is not a country at all. I'd like to see an America where illegal means illegal. I'd like to see an America where uh, U.S. taxpayer dollars aren't given to reward people for breaking the law. I'd specifically like to see an America, and indeed a state of Kansas for that matter, that doesn't discriminate against U.S. citizens and in favor of illegal aliens and allocating in-state tuition rates. I'd like to see an America where a president doesn't criticize an American state when that American state tries to help the president do his job. I'd like to see a U.S. Congress where one party doesn't stand up and applaud when a foreign leader criticizes the state of Arizona. In short, I'd like to see an America that looks a lot more like the state of Arizona. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for standing up for the rule of law. Thank you for uh, getting ready to take our country back on November 2nd. I know every one of you, if you haven't voted already, you're going to be voting. This is so important that we take back this country in this election. So make sure you tell your friends, tell your relatives, tell your neighbors. Make sure they vote. Knock on their door. Make sure they vote. And make sure we all take our country back. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it.